I'm Wayne Barnes. Uh, I first heard of Jim Rohn about uh, eight years ago, ten years ago. I heard him speak in Phoenix, and it, it majorly changed my life. Um, I took, started taking some notes, and as he spoke, I took more and more meticulous notes. I tape recorded what he had to say, found out where he was going to be going next. He was going to Albuquerque. I followed him around to a number of cities, and I kept those tape recordings and notes, and I and applied everything he said. I uh, read the books he said. I, I changed my mannerisms to uh, fit uh, the, some of the suggestions he had, and a few years later, Jim Rohn came through Phoenix and I walked up to him and I said, I, you don't remember me, but I'm Wayne Barnes and I, I just made over a million dollars. Uh, you found some of your principles and I just want to thank you. And uh, we went and had dinner and later we became friends and uh, we've, we've had an interesting life. We have uh, went sailing together on our boats and we uh, shared a lot of our experiences and I really enjoy uh, the friendship we've created. The suggestions and the things that he's given you today, uh, he gives an, at a quite premium prices uh, to people all the way around the world. And I hope that you take good notes. Uh, I think that you'll find it a major contribution to your life, just like it was to mine. And so with this, Jim Rohn. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. It's nice to... Uh have friends say such good things about you. I just finished a lecture a couple of uh, hours ago for uh, Sony Corporation. And some of the big wheels were there from Japan, along with about 160 other sales and management and administration people. So that was kind of exciting. Farm boy from Idaho lecturing to uh, Sony Corporation. It's got to be uh, one heck of a story. For you that haven't heard my story, I grew up in Idaho and lived a fairly normal, average American life. And got married at about age 22. And at age 25, I'm taking a look at my life, and I wasn't very happy. I was behind on my bills and behind on my promises and behind on my personal development. And I had a lot of things to be concerned about. With a paycheck on Friday of $57, it didn't look like I was going to be a smashing success. And I had already figured they weren't going to write any books about me, unless books called What Not to Do. Because I had done some things wrong and backwards and sort of drifted off course. But then, a unique thing happened to me. I met a very wealthy, remarkable man by the name of Mr. Schoff. And um, a friend of mine worked for him and kept saying, you've got to meet this man, and I had a chance to meet him. And sure enough, uh, that meeting was a significant milestone in my life. A few months later, this remarkable, wealthy, unique man hired me, and I went to work for him, spent five years before he died, and I accumulated from him during that five years ideas that changed my income, uh, changed my personality, changed my bank account, uh, changed my fortune-making potential. So I will always be grateful for meeting somebody who shared ideas. Then I promised him before he died that uh, to the best of my ability, I would share the ideas he shared with me. I would pass them along. And I didn't know it was going to mean coming to Arizona State and lecturing because I was going to pass them along to other people like he did with me in the course of business, right? Sitting at a breakfast table, a conference table, uh, sharing the ideas with my business colleagues. But then about um, 19 years ago, I got the idea that perhaps I should share these ideas with the public. And I thought maybe they'd like to hear the things that helped me to make my fortune. So I put together some notes. Didn't do too well on that first one. I stood up and my mind sat back down. But uh, at least I tried. I'm comfortable in the boardroom, a little more nervous on the platform. But I thought at least I've got to try. Maybe people would appreciate knowing some of the things that really made major changes in my life. So from that small attempt, starting uh, almost 20 years ago, I've been devoting part of my business time to lecturing. And about 14 years ago, it became a business. So now I get to travel to lots of countries, lots of cities, and I get to uh, lecture and share the ideas that I think can make a major difference in how your life works out. And it's great to be invited back to uh, Arizona State, back to the same room where we were, what, about 30 days ago? Uh, it says something to be invited back. Maybe it doesn't say everything, but it says something. Uh, maybe it says, let's give him one more chance, see if he can uh, pull it out this time. But anyway, I'm pleased to be back, and uh, I feel comfortable. And, and uh, some of you I recognize have... Uh, been to a couple of my lectures uh, since I was here last. 
I've got some more coming up. Look forward to seeing you. But I'd like to share with you today skills for success in the marketplace. The marketplace is a demanding place. There's plenty of opportunity, but uh, you've got to get ready for it and prepared for it. That's part of your stay at Arizona State, is getting ready. Big chunks of our life are designed for getting ready and getting prepared. We've got to spend a portion of this year getting ready for next year. And we've got to spend a portion of the 80s getting ready for the 90s. Hopefully the reason why we're here looking well, doing fairly well, is because we spent a portion of the 70s getting ready for the 80s. So a big share of life is getting ready, getting prepared. And part of, the, part of it is the development of skills. And I've got a good key phrase for you here to start with in skills that make for success in the marketplace. First, it starts with personal development, self-improvement, making measurable progress. Personal development is not an easy matter. It's a push. It's a struggle. It's a challenge. But that's what life is all about, the challenge. There wouldn't be any winning without a challenge. If I took a football and walked out and walked across the goal line out at the stadium today, I'm sure none of you would call it a touchdown. Uh, we don't call it a touchdown until you face the 260 pounders across the line. And then if you can make it through, score what we call a touchdown, now we call you winner. Now we call you accomplished. But that's what life is all about. It's the struggle and the challenge to develop ourselves and our skills to see what we can create in the way of value in the marketplace. And that's what life is all about, creating skills and value, and take those skills and value to the marketplace and see what it will return for you. Now it also has social part, spiritual part, as well as the physical part. We're gonna talk about some of those parts. Personal development is not an easy matter. New habits don't come easy, but they can be developed. Sometimes when you develop a lot of momentum in one direction, it's not that easy to change, but it is possible to change. It isn't easy, but it's possible. Somebody once said success is 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. You've just got to read the books, learn the skills, put yourself through the paces, do the mental push-ups, and uh, get yourself ready. Inspiration is fine, but inspiration must lead to discipline. It's one thing to be motivated, but it's another thing to be motivated sufficiently to take the classes, do the reading, do the repetition, go through it over and over until it becomes part of you. And those are challenges. They're not easy, but they're challenges that if you win and develop and grow, that's what determines your place, your return, your equity, the worth you get from the marketplace. I've divided personal development into three parts. Let me give you those. First is spiritual. And I know when you talk spiritual, you can get an argument most anywhere. But I have a simple belief that says humans are not just animals. Some people believe we're just a, an extension and an advanced form of the animal species. But humans are a bit unique. Uh, spiritual qualities, unique that unique part of us that makes us different from all other creation. And that's a good study, and I'm an amateur on that side of it, so I can't give you a lot of advice there, but I would be a student of the spiritual side of your nature. And whatever you have to read and assimilate to develop in that area, I would strongly suggest you do so. Here's the other two parts, physical and mental. And I've got a good phrase for you to make note of. The mind and the body work together. So we've got to give some attention to both development of mind and body. On the physical side, there's a unique Bible phrase that says, treat your body like a temple. It's not a bad word. A temple, something you would take extremely good care of. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed, right? A temple. Take good care of it. <clears throat> the only house we have to live in currently, right, is the physical body we have. And that's part of success in the marketplace, is physical well-being, feeling good about yourself physically, so that you stride into the marketplace with a sense of self-worth and self-confidence, having taken care of that end of it. 
it covers several parts, good nutrition. Shof got me hooked on good nutrition. My parents, my father's 82, my mother's 75, you'd probably call them health nuts. Right? They really pay strict attention, but the payoff has been so incredible. My father's 82, he's got 20 more years of goals. And my parents are both still working extremely hard, all kinds of projects they're working on, making money. They got tax problems this year, right? That's pretty good at 82, right? Tax problems. I like that. Um, so physically, you can do extremely well if you just pay some attention. Part of it's good nutrition. Read all the books, make up your own mind, right? There's a lot of weird conflicts in the nutritional aspects, but you just got to read and decide for yourself what's a good plan for you, good health plan. They got some weird stuff in California where I'm from, but uh, you can sort through all the weird stuff. Unless you're weird, you just do the weird stuff, right? But there's all kinds of stuff to consider in taking care of yourself physically. The other, right, good exercise program, right, taking care of yourself physically. The other is physical appearance. To do well in the marketplace, that's one skill. To be skillful enough to take care of your appearance in the marketplace, it has a lot to do with your acceptance on the job, performing, company, corporation, community. A big share of it is how you appear to other people. I've got a good Bible phrase for you. It says, God looks on the inside, people look on the outside. That's not a bad suggestion. Meaning, take care of the inside for God, take care of the outside for people. You say, well, people shouldn't judge you by your appearance. Well, let me give you a point. They do. Right? Don't base your life on shoulds and shouldn'ts. Only base your life on realities. Now, sure, when people get to know you, they'll judge you by more than what they see, but at first, they're going to take a look. Okay, so physical appearance is part of the physical side of the personal development to take care of. Now, I got another good phrase for you that I think is a good balance. It says, be conscious of self, but not self-conscious. There's a certain point we need to be conscious of ourselves to a point to take care of it, but then let it go. Some people worry about their appearance all day and it detracts rather than adds. So it's called take care of it, let it go. Do the best you can, let that get the job done. Okay, conscious of ourselves, but not to the point of being self-conscious. Now here's the third part to personal development, the mind. Mind stretch, mind exercise. This is part of your stay here, Arizona State. Stretch your mind, thinking habits, developing good study habits, developing ways and means and methods of pursuing ideas, coming up with the logic of information, trying to find ways to apply it to human behavior, the marketplace, carve out your spot. All of that takes mind stretch and mind exercise. Part of it is stretching yourself in reading habits. You can't live on mental candy. So you've got to have the full range of mental food in order to grow. We call that mind stretch. Part of your stay here is to tackle things that other people have found a little too difficult, but you've decided to see it through and see if you can't master it. That's part of your education here. That's part of what gives you an extraordinary edge in the marketplace. Your willingness to tackle subjects that are difficult that most people have decided to let slide. Some kids your age, right, have decided just to get a job and let the rest of the education slide. But you've tackled some rather heavyweight subjects, right? This being one. How can you master part of the, the, the high skills, the extraordinary skills that make you an unusual performer in the marketplace? It takes mind stretch. Some people skip poetry and, and uh, literature, the Bible, history, and a lot of things that seem a little difficult to attack. But if you always back away from something that seems a little difficult at first, uh, you leave yourself weak and you leave yourself unprepared in the marketplace. So don't be afraid to tackle the heavyweight stuff. It may be a lot easier than you think once you get into it and learn skill after skill. Another part of mind stretch is uh, learn the other side of the argument. And whether you're debating spiritual, political, physical, behavior, Whatever it is, don't be afraid of the other side of the argument. In our last class, I think we talked about 
communism teaches capital belongs in the hands of the state. Uh, we teach capital belongs in the hands of the people. And that's a great debate, whether capital belongs in the hands of the state or the people. Now, some people say, oh, don't tell us what communism teaches. Well, if you're going to be a good debater, you've got to know the other side of the argument. So that's what I'm asking you to do. Don't be afraid of the other side of the argument. Okay? If you're strong mentally, you can handle it. Okay. And you've got to give people points, right, for their side of the argument. I was in Canada one time, listened to a speech, extreme liberal position, rather than the conservative, rugged individualism, right? But the guy had a good point. He said, Every man for himself, said the elephant as he danced among the chickens. I thought, pretty good point. I got to give him one for that. So give credit to somebody that's got a good point. Even though you don't agree with their argument, you must agree that they came up with a good point. So that's part of mind stretch, studying the other side of the argument. Now part of all of this is developing what I call a personal development library. Mr. Schof got me started back when I was 25, and since I'd missed most of my college education, here's what he said to me, I pass it along to you. He said, be self-educated. In fact, education doesn't cease when you leave college, leave the university. Education is a lifetime process. We keep putting ourselves through the paces to learn. That's how you get into the higher numbers income. That's how you get into the higher brackets enterprise. That's how you become a more useful, productive, valuable citizen making a contribution to family, community, country, enterprise. Is to work hard on developing these skills and be self-educated. Mr. Shove said to me, standard education gets you standard results. And he said, if I were you, I would check those numbers and see if that's what you want to settle for. But he said to me, why not go beyond the standard and the average and the acceptable and become the advantaged, the extraordinary, the extra capable? And I picked up on that. Because I had decided back at age 18, 19, just to get a job and work hard, do the best I could. And Shof said, there's a lot more to life than that. Why don't you master some extraordinary skills? Why don't you move up to the higher performance and see if you wouldn't find the taste better in the results you get from that exercise. I did that. Now your personal development library needs to be a whole mix. It can't just be a, a single piece of it. Some people these days are just into self-improvement, self-help, inspirational things, but since you can't live on mental candy, you need more than that. Our library needs to be balanced like the pantry in your kitchen. You can't be strong just on the easy stuff. You gotta tackle the full range. History. If you haven't got this book, I recommend it. Lessons of History by Durant. The Durants wrote, I think, 11 volumes on civilization. Lessons of History by Durant. It's only 100 pages. You can read it in one evening, but once you read it, I think you'll read it over and over and over it is such a classic and it's so well done. You'll appreciate the language, the style, the flow, as well as the concepts and the ideas. It's a capsule view of history in 100 pages. I mean, it's an extraordinary, small, but very powerful book, Lessons of History. We should all be better students of history, our own history, our own roots, our own country, our own state, our own community, right? Our own family history. And then, of course, we should study world history. It's major. Next is uh, biographies, autobiographies. Studying people who have done unique things. Both admirable and despicable. We need to be students of both. We need a book on Gandhi and a book on Hitler. I've got a unique book in my library, probably isn't available anymore, called The First Billionaire, Story of Henry Ford. There's a lot of billionaires now, but Henry was number one. Back when a billion dollars was a lot of money. The First Billionaire, fascinating story. We take great delight, right, in reading stories of unique people who overcame all kinds of odds, 
started small and developed into something unique, admirable. Novels, sometimes novels are great ways of sharing dialogue and ideas and philosophy woven into the story. Sometimes the sweep of the story carries us along, but sure enough, little by little, we're getting the dialogue. Anne Rand had a unique way, right, of building this towering novel, but weaving her philosophy all the way through the stories. The dialogue, the conversations, the communication. One of the best in dialogue movies is called Lion in Winter. Peter O'Toole, Catherine Hepburn. It's a fascinating story in a movie, but the dialogue, the sweep, the questions, the, the give and take, the exchange is so incredible. The use of language to paint pictures and ideas. Uh, it's a classic. It's a classic. Then we need the full range of culture, the dance, the arts, literature. By the way, there's another good book. Let me give you the title. It's called How to Read a Book. Nice simple title. How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. Mortimer Adler is the chief editor of the new Encyclopedia Britannica. He's 85 years old, still going strong, and still writing books. He was interviewed on one of his books last year called The Six Great Ideas. Mortimer Adler, unique philosopher. He's also got a brand new book out, uh, How to Speak, How to Listen. If you walk into the bookstore, you'll probably see four or five books written by Mortimer Adler. He conducts a workshop still, age 85, up in Aspen. He's incredible. But he wrote this book, How to Read a Book. Now, from the book, How to Read a Book, he's got some good uh, points in there on how to master a book, how to take the good stuff that's in the book and make it a part of your own consciousness. Excellent. But here's what else is in there. A list of the great books. And I'm sure you've come across a variety of lists, but this is a pretty good one. The best books ever written according to Mortimer Adler. Not a bad guideline to follow. I've used it in part, at least, in building my own library, how to read a book. Then we need books on geography and language. We also need to study a bit of law. Some of you may be pursuing that direction, I don't know. No matter what you're going to do in life, we all need a bit of a fundamentals on law, contracts, what to sign, what not to sign. Almost everything now has legal implications, right? Everything now is a bit complicated. I remember one time a company wanted to borrow some money from a bank. The bank said, yes, we will loan this company the money if Mr. Rohn will sign personally. And I knew these people. I wanted to play hero, and I knew they could pay the money back. So I said, yes, I will sign. So I signed for the note, quarter of a million dollars. And the company borrows the money. About 10 months later, they pay it all back. I'm a hero. Well, about a year later, this same company gets in financial trouble. They go back to the bank and borrow this quarter of a million dollars again. But I'm not on this one, right? And I say to myself, I'm glad I'm not on that loan. I wouldn't sign it, not for a million dollars. But then I get a letter about a year later when the company goes bankrupt and cannot meet their obligation to the bank. The bank writes me this letter and says, Dear Mr. Rohn, since we have here your guarantee, and uh, since the company cannot meet its obligation, would you send us your personal check for a quarter of a million dollars? I thought there must be some mistake. I was on that first loan, right? But they paid it back. I wouldn't have signed the second one, not in a million years. But guess what I didn't know I had signed originally? A continuing guarantee. I didn't know. So, I'm asking you now, learn what to sign. Take my uh, little bit of lesson there that was extremely costly. I now read everything more carefully. I one time added up what the word continuing cost me. And believe me, it's expensive. So we all need some understanding. Personal development library. Okay, there's a lot of other things we could mention, but I've got some more of these skills to cover so we can't take too much time. Next. In personal development, I've developed five steps to success, or four, 
Let me give you four. Four steps to success. In the quest for personal development, here's part of the major subjects to study. Four steps to success. Here's the first one. Good ideas. Ideas are the life seeds of enterprise and the better life. It comes first of all by the search for good ideas. Never cease your quest for knowledge. Finding ideas can be life-changing. Business ideas, social ideas, personal ideas. Somebody once said, nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Timely ideas, political ideas, family ideas, ideas for health, skill, uniqueness. So be a searcher of good ideas and then do what I do. I don't have my journal here handy, but keep a journal, keep a log of good ideas. We call this for the serious students. I used to take notes on pieces of paper and found out I, I couldn't go through them, couldn't catalog them, and I missed a lot of good stuff. So I learned to keep good ideas in a journal. And I've been keeping journals now all these years. It's an extension of your learning library. In fact, there are three treasures to leave behind. Let me give you this, three treasures to leave behind. One is your pictures. Take lots of pictures. Picture taking is one of the phenomenons of the 20th century. And it's easy to take phenomenons for granted. Right? We can record the event now in a fraction of a second. Did you ever look back two or three generations, just a handful of pictures? Boy, if they'd have had the technology of today, we could have had such a better history by all the pictures, so take lots of pictures. Number two in the success ladder. Be a student of good plans. Plans are important because they take ideas to the marketplace. Plans give birth to ideas. Plans well executed bring ideas into enterprise, bring ideas into the better life. Ideas without plans forever hang like an artist's rendering on the wall. They never become reality. They never become substance. They're only dreams that are born dead without activity. So I'm asking you, learn good plans, good disciplined activity plans. Riches do not come by crossing your fingers, walking through the day, hoping. Riches and wealth come from well-laid plans. In my last session with you, we learned if a child starts between the ages of 12 and 15 with a good plan and a normal average income by age 40, they should be wealthy. At 45, the latest, with a good wealth plan and average income between ages 12 to 15 and 45 is enough time to become wealthy. Now, if you're not wealthy by age 45, it simply means you didn't have a good plan. Opportunity without good plans misses all the worth and the wealth you could have. So be a student of good plans. Here's the next part to the success formula, the four steps. The passing of time. All of us have to learn to handle time. It's one of the challenges of life, how to handle the passing of time. Here's sometimes something a little difficult to handle, waiting from spring till fall. That's not an easy stretch, especially if you have heavyweight creditors. You've planted in the spring and now the creditors are on you in the summer. We have a tendency to walk out into the field and say, grow, crop, grow. They're on me. But we have to learn to wait. You know, part of it is patience. And Americans probably have to learn patience more than any other people on earth in our push-button society, right? But it takes patience, the passing of time. The fourth step in the success ladder is the solving of problems. It's a simple way to put success. Success is simply solving problems. Now there's all kinds of problems. Business problems, family problems, personal problems, financial problems, emotional problems, right? We've all got problems. Everybody's got a list of problems. The rich merely ask for a longer list. Okay. Problem solving is where enterprise comes from. 
This is how you build worth and wealth, solving the problems. I met Neil Armstrong one time, first man on the moon. I met him in Chicago. He's got a unique talk, his experiences being the first man on the moon. And Neil Armstrong put it fairly simply. He said, going to the moon and back was simply a matter of solving problems. I thought, what a neat, simple way to put it. Problem one, how to get there. Problem two, how to get back. That's simple, right? And he said, make sure you don't leave till you've solved both problems. <laughs> well put. Now, sure, some things are, are complicated, but if you take it piece at a time and solve the problems, put it back together, you can't believe the enterprise you can build, the life you can build, the skills you can build. Take it piece at a time, master it, put it back together, solve it. Now, let me give you another tip on solving problems. This was helpful for me. Learn to solve them on paper. I learned this some time ago. You've got to commit some of your thoughts to paper. If you just deal out of your head all the time, it's, e it's easy to make too many errors, right? You wouldn't build a house out of your head. You take what's in your head, put it on paper, work it out, and then you work from the document, work from the paper. And sometimes problem solving is uh, the same kind of challenge. First of all, to put it on paper. Take a piece of paper, divide it in half, put the problem over here. And you just spend a little time outlining the problem. Instead of just thinking about it, put your thoughts on paper. The executives I work with around the world who do extremely well, most of them use this kind of strategy, putting a problem on paper. It helps you to focus. It helps you to zero in. Now, when you state the problem, to the best of your ability, you just add one question, is that all of it? You say, well, we're not to dwell on problems. No, we're not to dwell on them or live in them, but at least you've got to state them because you can't solve them till you clearly define them. Okay? Now, let me give you part of the answer to solving problems. The solutions. Answers to solving problems fall into three simple questions. And let me give you those questions. And I think for problem solving, it's important to go through these questions one, two, three. Okay? Here's the first one. What could I do to solve the problem? What could I do? And then you start developing what we call working papers. And I know all of you in university, right, are familiar with working papers. Working papers simply are doing your best, right? You say, well, here's number one, that's an answer, potential answer. Number two, that's a possibility. Number three, that's a possibility. You just start laying out possible solutions. Then we teach, go back and analyze these solutions. Number three, you've already come to the conclusion is too, it would take too long. Okay. Number two, too big a question mark. Number one, this is probably it. My first inclination was right. Study that a little more and see if that's it. Okay, develop what we call working papers. So the first step to solving a problem is write it down. Number two, develop working papers on possible solutions of what you could do. Now, if that doesn't do it, here's the second question to ask. What could I read? Sure enough, there may be a book. There may be a text. There may be a cassette. There may be a video. There may be some form, outline on your particular problem. Okay? If you went to the library, you might find a whole section right on your problem you say gosh there's 50 books here there's bound to be some answers so now you start going through the books okay book one book two book three okay and start developing your reaction to what you're reading right number one you say this guy's crazy right because you're going to come up with some crazy stuff weird stuff right but you just go through all these books okay developing your own analysis with these books of the stuff you've read Okay, that's the second question, what could I read? Here's the third question in solving a problem. Who could I ask? Now, here's the key. Don't hesitate to ask. But let me give you the next clue. Don't ask first. If you always just ask, 
usually you don't develop the skills in solving problems. Let me tell you what's more valuable than the solution to a problem. Answer, the skills of solving problems. The skill is more valuable than the answer. The answer to a problem we call temporary. Skills in solving problems we call permanent. So it's not just answers we need, it's skills we need. Concentrate on these five abilities. I call these the five abilities that help you skillfully attack the marketplace to do well. Here's the first ability. Develop the ability to absorb. The ability to absorb. The ability to soak in, take in, be like a sponge. Sitting in class sometimes it's easy to daydream. It's easy to be preoccupied. It's easy to be somewhere else. I read a good article once though in Reader's Digest. The title was, Wherever You Are, Be There. I thought that was excellent. Be there. Concentration, right? The sports stars will tell you, all you need is just a slight miss of concentration. They put one by your feet and there goes the championship. Just a slight slip of concentration. Now it's also important in learning extra skills to really pay attention, absorb, take in. I have a wealthy friend of mine. I swear it's more exciting to have him go to Acapulco and come back and tell you about it than it is to go yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. Let me tell you why. When he's there, he doesn't miss anything. He soaks it all up. His mind is like a movie projector that takes it all in. The sights and the sounds and the smell and the color and the people and what's going on. He sees it all. Then he also has the gift of expression. When he comes back, he can tell you about it, word for word, detail, detail. When he talks, you can feel the water lapping on your feet. Right? You can smell the aroma of the food. You can see the sights and the sounds and the color and the people. I mean, he's got these gifts, the gift to take it in and then the gift to share it. And those are extremely excellent skills to work on. And that first one is absorb. Let me give you a good clue. Most people are trying to get through the day. I've got a better objective for you. Learn to get from the day. Not just get through it, get from it. Soak it up. Each day is a piece of the mosaic of your life. Don't waste any. Treat them with care. See how much you can get from a day. How much advice, how much information, how much color, how much sight and sound to add to your worth and your wealth and your equity of mind. Here's the next Skill, develop the skill to respond. The ability to be affected by what you see and hear and sense. Success is not just knowledge. Success is response to knowledge. Success is not just experience. Success is emotion created from experience. It's the emotional part that plays such a big, major part in our life and our future and our success. Responding to life means let sad things make you sad. Let happy things make you happy. Let puzzling things puzzle you, right? Let things that are difficult create difficulty for you. Respond. I'm the greatest guy in the world to take to the movies. I get affected by a good movie. I'm willing to go. If they want to take me on a journey, if it's a good movie, good dialogue, something good to see, watch this whole story unfold, I'm willing to go. I forget everything and just go. Be affected by it. I was in Melbourne, Australia, not that long ago, and I saw an advertisement. See Dr. Zhivago on the big screen. I thought, I got to go see it on the big screen. Right? They got these little cracker box theaters now, right? I like the big movie theaters with the drapes and the chandeliers and the balconies, right? I mean, that's the movies. These little cracker boxes now, right? Popcorn two feet deep. I mean, uh, you know, and when you walk, you walk out of your shoes because they stick to the floor. I mean, it leaves a lot to be desired. But to see a movie in a proper movie theater on the big screen, I got enticed by it. And I'd seen Dr. Zhivago, I don't know, probably half a dozen times, right? 
I said, I got to go see it, though, one more time on the big screen. So I go, sure enough, this sweeping saga drama of the Rev uh, Russian Revolution, right? Dr. Zhivago, the whole story unfolds. And I'm swept along by it all. But up until that particular time, I had always missed the significance of the end of the movie. But this time I got it. The other times I'd missed it. Comrade General says, Tanya, how did you come to be lost? And she said, I was just lost. He said, no, how did you come to be lost? And she didn't want to say. She said, well, my father and I were running through the city. It was on fire. The revolution had come. And I was lost. And Comrade General said, no, Tanya, how did you come to be lost? And she finally said, while we were running, my father let go of my hand. And I was lost. That's what she didn't want to say. He let go. Comrade General says, Tanya, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I'm positive Komorowski was not your real father. This man, Dr. Zhivago, that I knew well, I'm positive he was your father. I've been looking for you. I think I found you. This man, Dr. Zhivago, this was your real father. And he said, Tanya, let me tell you something. If this man, your real father, had been there, I promise you, he would never have let go of your hand. And I got it. I got it that time. Wow. The other times I'd missed it, right? I'm eating popcorn waiting for the movie to finish, I guess. I don't know. The other times. So that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to get it. And I'm asking you to let it affect you. Let it do things to you. It builds your emotional bank. It builds your emotional bank. Number three is reflect. Learn to reflect. Reflecting is an extra way of getting more value from what you know and what you've been through. Reflecting is going back over. Let me give you some good times to reflect. One, at the end of the day. Take just a few minutes at the end of the day and go back over the day. Find a place, right? If you can, get alone. Just go back and think through the day. Where have you been and what did you see and what did you hear and what did you feel? If you'll just relive it, go back through it, I'm telling you, it will add multiplied value to you. The day you've just been through will be more valuable for your future if you just go back through it. Take a few hours at the end of the week. Hours at the end of the week, right? Minutes at the end of the day, hours at the end of the week, half a day at the end of the month, a weekend at the end of the year. Those are called times to reflect. Now, why go back over? Why run the tapes again? Let me tell you why. To make the past more valuable. It's like color enhancers. Right? The cameras take pictures of Jupiter, right? On its flyby. But let me tell you what they do with those pictures. Right? The computer has learned to enhance them with color. So they become vivid and unique. And our eyes get big and we take a look and we say, wow, with the enhancers. And that'll, that's what will happen to your life. If you'll take the time to review what's going on, review the decisions you're making, review the people you're with, review the action you're taking, the decisions you're making, review all that stuff, go back through the feelings, go back through what's happening. I'm telling you, the color enhancers of your own mind will make your own life more valuable. Now, why try to make your life valuable? Simple answer, to invest it in the future. We call that bright. We call that skillful. To make more out of your past, to have more value to invest in the future. That's a different attitude than just trying to get through one more day. Trying to get through one more week. Is to gather up your past and invest it in the future. When my father was about to turn 76, I said, dear father of mine, can you imagine how exciting it's going to be to take the last 75 years of your life and invest them in your 76th? That's an extraordinary thing to learn, how to take more of you and invest it in the next conversation, invest it in the next decision, invest it in the next activity. Okay. Now here's number four, fourth ability. Develop the ability to act. The ability to take action on your feelings and your knowledge. 
Action, disciplined action, is what gives birth to ideas, enterprise, value. Without activity, ideas and dreams are stillborn. They have no life. Disciplined activity is the most demanding of arts to take you where you want to go. Now, sometimes it doesn't take much of a change of activity. Let me show you this little illustration. Let's say here's where you are. Just put a little dot on your paper and say, here's where you are. In 10 years, you can be here, or in 10 years, you can be here. And in 10 years, there's a lot of difference between here and here. But right now, there isn't much difference in daily disciplines. Daily, weekly disciplines are those small changes of intelligent activity that take you now in a better direction. We use a good question that says, 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. The question is, where? Right? Good question. Now, here's the comment. Now's the time to fix it. Now's the time to fix the next 10 years. Fix a better course. Now, to unsophisticated people, what they do during the day doesn't seem to matter. But to sophisticated people, it makes all the difference in the world. The books you read, the actions you take, the disciplines you engage in on a daily basis, those are the activities that are taking you, taking you, taking you somewhere. And all of us need to take a look at where our daily activities are taking us. Okay. That's number three. Disciplined activity. Activity of learning, activity of mind. Health disciplines, wealth disciplines, culture disciplines, right? All values come from disciplines. Ideas put into disciplined activity create value. Now here's number five, the fifth ability. In our personal development quest, developing skills that create success in the marketplace. Number five is develop the ability to share. Sharing is a unique human capacity. Sharing is a phenomenon, especially in the human experience. It seems when we share, we are the bigger and the better for it. It looks like if you shared something and gave it away, you'd be less, but it's a paradox. This is a paradox. What you share creates for you more. That's why we call it a paradox. You're not diminished by sharing, you're increased. If you have a child and you love it dearly, if the second child comes along, must you now cut your love in half? And the answer is no. From some strange, mysterious source comes an increased capacity. From sharing with the first, capacity and awareness and uniqueness is increased. So that's what I would ask you to do. Become gifted in sharing. There's many ways to share. One is by language. The gift of language. One of the most important studies for you is the study of communication. How to affect other people with words. I've got some good steps to communication. One is have something good to say. Saying something is, it has to come from something. You can't speak what you don't know. Talking is like writing a check. And you want to make sure you've got a verbal check that'll cash when you get ready to talk. And here's the true power of communication. When what you say is only the tip of the iceberg of all you know. That's, we call that power. I'm sure we've all been around some people who very quickly told us more than they knew. But this is called do your homework. Have something good to share. Have something good to say. Communication is part of sharing. Then learn to say it well. Part of the gift of language is saying it uniquely. John Kennedy said of Churchill during World War II, Winston Churchill had the unique ability to take the English language and send it into battle. And the words he composed and the speeches he gave and the language and the style gave such hope 
and uniqueness and structure to the free world that soon the enemy was defeated. But part of it was the structure of the language, the skill, the gift of saying things well. It's one of those incredible gifts, saying it well. Then learning to read your audience. When you talk, you just got to be interested enough to look and see how you're doing. I had to learn that. At first I was so absorbed in what I was saying, I'm sure the audience could have left and I would have never known it. But I finally learned to look up and see what's going on here, over here, in the back. My largest audience has been 10,500 people. And uh, that is a real stretch, right? What's going on? Three balconies. I had people behind me. And I wasn't the only speaker that day. Art Linkletter, Paul Harvey, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. But uh, that was an experience for me, learning to read, to see, to study, the reflection of whoever you're communicating with. That's an art, that's a skill. And the last one is intensity. Words with strong feeling change the meaning. Words can have power if they're loaded with emotion and belief, and courage, love, understanding, awareness, sympathy, concern, being touched by somebody. If you put more of that into what you say, it'll have a more incredible effect. Those kind of skills to share, to articulate, to give people a reading on what's going on in our heart, our mind, our soul, our spirit. Learn to share your emotions. And the last one is learn to share your knowledge. You can't believe how well you can help somebody just by recommending a book, recommend a poem, Share a word, a phrase. You say, hey, I just read this. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Somebody reads it and comes back and says, hey, that had an impact on my life. I'm glad you shared that with me. That started me thinking. That started me looking, started me reaching, started me searching. And you can start getting compliments. I'm now lecturing to about 7,000 people a month, six, 7,000. And I get now lots of letters and phone calls, people saying, what you said made a difference for me. And that's an incredible feeling. But you don't have to lecture to 7,000 to get that same feedback. All you have to do is recommend a book, share an idea. Somebody comes back and says, that book got me started. The things you told me that breakfast that morning, wow, I've been thinking about that. I'm making some changes. So you can have this incredible pleasure that comes from sharing ideas. Now, another unique thing about sharing is what you pour out creates capacity for more. So if you pour out what you know, if you pour out what you feel, if you let go in a sharing way, the good things that have come your way, it's part of the skill in the marketplace of developing success, wealth, and value. And I would wish that for you. In fact, all of the things we've talked about today, I would wish for you the benefit that comes from it all. But I know that it takes the discipline first. One last phrase. Promise is on the other side of price. For the promise, you must always pay the price. I'm sure we've all watched the television show Fame, where the teacher says, here's where you start to pay. If you want the glory of the stage, and not just the glory of the stage, but a glory of a unique family. If you want the glory and the recognition of a unique enterprise, if you want the glory of a job well done, you got to pay up front. And this is part of the pay. But once you get a taste of value, you don't mind paying the discipline. So I want to thank you today for letting me come by and have a chance to visit with you. And I wish for you all these good things that come from paying the price. The next time we get together, I'm sure we'll be able to trade some stories about the value we've gotten from sharing with each other today. Thank you for inviting me. See you next time.